All right, so good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started. It's uh, 6 p.m. here on June 22nd, yes, 2022, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, the purpose of tonight's meeting is to um, give a snapshot of some of the infrastructure projects that we have planned for this year, as well as some that will carry on into next year, um, and give you a chance to uh, share your ideas, your concerns, uh, ask questions about these projects, and hopefully start to build towards, you know, uh, a broader shared vision for what we want to see here in the city. Uh, as you know, infrastructure is a, is a hot topic right now on a national scale. There's a ton of resources out there from the federal government to the state government, and we want to try to get as many of those resources here in the city of Elyria. So hearing your ideas of projects that you want to see, today's the meeting for it. You also have ideas about uh, ways that we could do things better. Uh, we want to hear those ideas as well. And so we have a, a short PowerPoint presentation we'll be going through that'll talk about uh, a number of big projects we have going on. And then we'll save time at the end for some Q&A and some of the ideation that you may have. And um, hopefully, again, you'll walk away more informed. You know, you'll be more informed of what's going on in your city. I think that's our number one goal. I think a lot of people are wondering, what's the deal with this? What's the deal with that? So, and then the other is when things are going to happen. Hopefully you'll walk away with an idea of when it'll happen so you're not driving down the street and all of a sudden you're like, what happened here? You're kind of aware of what's coming down the pipe. Um, and then, um, again, a space for you to be able to share your ideas and thoughts that you have. So uh, we have our city engineers here, our, uh, Kathy McKillops, John Schneider. Uh, we have our superintendent, Terry Corzan, here as well. Um, so we got staff here that can answer very technical questions as well. I'm not an engineer. I don't play one on television either. So I'm not going to try to answer engineering type questions. Um, what I'll do is defer to the experts. But again, this is a chance for you all to get informed. Um, and I, you know, that's one of the goals of our administration, our team, is to make sure that citizens have accurate, timely information. So uh, this is our, 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 our uh, attempt to do that for you all. So again, so the order of business for, for today's meeting, um, as, as you heard, I'm doing some of the intro stuff, and then uh, uh, City Engineer McKillops is going to talk about infrastructure at a global scale to kind of put some context to what infrastructure is. Then we'll get specific into some projects, in, in particular East Broad and Cleveland Street. Uh, we'll talk about the East Side sewer relief. We'll talk about some of the city resurfacing projects. We'll talk about uh, some of the public works projects that we have planned for this year. And again, I'll come back up at the end and we'll, we'll have some Q&A and some ideation time here as well. So um, our goal is to make this meeting about an hour or so. I know uh, a lot of you have a lot of things planned. So I'm going to stick around after the meeting, uh, but we want to make sure we're sensitive to folks who've probably been here since 7 o'clock this morning, um, that they can get a chance to be with their family. So with that being said, I'll pass it over to our city engineer, Ms. Kathy McKillops. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, everyone. Infrastructure, today's meeting is about infrastructure. What is infrastructure? It's the basic equipment and structures that are needed to um, make a city function as it should, makes a city function properly, um, economically, environmentally. Um, examples of infrastructure uh, we see every day. You drive on roads, you drive on bridges, you walk on sidewalks. Um, infrastructure that you may not see every day or you may not see at all are the infrastructure that's underground, our water mains, our sewer mains, um, valves, pump stations, um, those type of infrastructure are a key part of our overall structure as we um, operate efficiently, environmentally. Um, and part of this infrastructure world is the maintenance, uh, replacement, maintaining, um, that includes materials, operations and maintenance, that's labor, uh, vehicles that 
you know, are used by our staff members, our employees that maintain our infrastructure. And how are these um, infrastructure items paid for? So for example, streets, and that's something that we'll talk about tonight, um, are issue six funds. Tonight you'll see that um, we have a large resurfacing program for 2022. Um, bulk of that, majority of that, is being paid with issue six funds, which was passed by the voters. Also, uh, gas tax funds and license plate funds also contribute to uh, street resurfacing, street reconstruction, um, bridge rehab, culvert replacement, we'll mention tonight. Um, sewers and water mains, those are maintained using user fees. So when you get your water bill, the fees that you pay for your water usage, your sewer usage, goes towards the operation and maintenance of these facilities. It's definitely not cheap, but we know that it's a necessity. It's a necessity. It's the foundation of the overall structure and equipment that you know the city is required to have to properly function. Other funding sources include federal and state grant funds. The mayor mentioned briefly, you know, that we're hoping that there are grant funds that come about um, here in the near future, and we'd like to tap into that, fingers crossed, uh, because in the end that helps not only um, our infrastructure, our city, it helps our ratepayers, it helps our taxpayers, it just helps the overall city um, infrastructure. Uh, we also use subsidized um, state revolving loans. Those are loans that we get from the state at a reduced interest rate. We're gonna move on now to project information. Um, the next item is East Broad Street, and what we'd like to do is we can go through the entire presentation, then open it up to questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, and the mayor, of course, will help moderate that section. So um, Mr. John Schneider will take it from here on the next two projects. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, one of the uh, up and coming projects for the city is the uh, reconstruction of East Broad Street. Uh, the project limits extend from East River Road over to South Abbey. Um, the existing road, just for some context, uh, the road is two lanes with one lane in each direction. Uh, it has uh, one, two, three, four, five traffic lights, uh, excluding Abbey Road. Uh, along the corridor and uh, these traffic lights, a lot of them are antiquated, they're old. Uh, they don't have the, the newest functions that we have today. Uh, they actually operate on a preset program timing that essentially is efficient. Uh, so when you've been sitting at a, when you sit at a, a traffic light and all you see it do is bounce between uh, the different sides, it's because it's largely working on a, a clock essentially. So. Um, so that's the type of infrastructure we have out there um, currently. Uh, a safety study was uh, completed in 2019. As part of the safety study, it, 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 they counted the vehicles on the road, which averaged around 10,000, just over 10,000 vehicles a day. Uh, as part of the safety study, also you, you go out and you uh, take a look at the accidents that were, and these are just accidents reported uh, through the police uh, department. So they pulled crash data along the, the, the corridor and a large percentage of the crashes were actually rear end crashes, which will lead into the reasons for parts of the design of this project. Uh, the, uh, the effects are from the, uh, the conclusions from the uh, uh, safety study showed that uh, the two lanes of traffic is uh, not the ideal scenario for the roadway. It was to convert it, the roadway to a three lanes of traffic with one lane of traffic in each direction and having a centered uh, lane, which is actually a two-way left turn lane. You see this over on 
Lake Avenue as well as Cleveland Street uh, over there by the Taco Bell on Cleveland Street, uh, which ODOT had completed for the city uh, a, a few years ago. So essentially that is the style of the road you'd see. Uh, as part of the safety study it identified that the traffic signals obviously were uh, inefficient. It also didn't include preemption, which East Broad Street being on the corridor for the hospital is a very vital component that allows the lights to turn green in the direction for the safety forces as well as the EMS. So EMS can get a green light going into town or even out of town when they're going to the scene. Uh, vehicle detection to provide the efficiency. Uh, the, the signals out there lack pedestrian crossings as well. There are crosswalks. And once again, the timing of the, of, the, of the lights allow for people to cross but if no one's there, why call up timing for somebody not to be there? So that's part of the, the safety study, what it identified, as well as, which we all know, improve the rideability. Uh, the roadway is, uh, has quite a few potholes. It's, it's uh, in def uh, definitely in need of repair, um, as well as other pedestrian travel uh, type of movements. One of the things we like to look at nowadays when we do these larger projects is not just how to move cars, but how do you move bikes, how you move people who walk and move them uh, not only efficiently, but making sure it's safer. And, that, and that's the main concern uh, that they look at. And, and uh, you'll see, we receive quite a bit of funds, safety funds that helped pay for these improvements. Um, also other items, on top of the few things I just mentioned, uh, concrete curbs. We were going to replace a lot of the concrete curbs out there. Uh, the section of roadway from Prospect Street to South Abbey currently doesn't have curbs, but the, the proposed project is to lower the road, put in curbs, uh, and this way in, 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 when you put in curbs, it's going to require you to put in some catch basins and storm sewers to help control storm water out there, so it helps prevent flooding onto people's driveways, which in turn requires uh, concrete driveway aprons to be replaced as well. <laughs> so there's a multitude of, multitude of things that are done in order to get to the, the end goal there. Um, the, uh, the signage and pavement markings will all be updated to high-vis uh, markings and, and signs so that you can see them better at night with the reflection of your uh, your uh, uh, lights from your vehicle. The uh, traffic light signals uh, will go to the, the style, the mast arm style, opposed to, I believe a lot of them out there right now are, are strain pulls. Uh, and because this corridor is an east-west corridor, one of the things you like to have on those traffic lights are back plates. They help shield the sun a little bit to make it easier to see during those times of day, as well as the larger 12-inch diameter lenses. Uh, and the signals will have pedestrian countdowns and they will have push buttons to allow the, the, the traffic light to be responsive and not just uh, move around in a clock. So uh, the vehicle detection software will also be included as well as uh, the preemption. Uh, on the south side of the road, the plan is to put an eight foot multi-use path. Uh, this path is proposed to be an asphalt path and we chose asphalt there's pros and cons of both concrete and asphalt. Uh, asphalt is smoother. There's no, you don't have to have contraction, contraction and uh, expansion joints every 10 to 12 feet. So it provides a smoother path. It's flexible, opposed to rigid. Uh, so I mean, there are pros and cons. It, it, an asphalt path, it looks more like a park's field. So it gives you a uh, more enjoyable uh, time typically for most people who are on the asphalt path opposed to the concrete. Um, now a con for it would be that it gets too, maybe when the sun's on it, it gets too hot. But uh, so unfortunately, no matter which way you go, there's always pros and cons. Uh, the, the plan is to, to place the, the multi-use path on the side, on the, like I said, on the south side, where the current sidewalk edge is to the house, the do path will be in the exact same location. It will just be moved closer to the road. So you'll have a little bit wider path, but 
it will not be closer to any of the properties out there. Um, so, and uh, as well as the ADA ramps and, and whatnot will be will be brought into compliance as well. And here is a, a typical section of what the road looks like. Uh, you have your, it shows up there, you have your, your two lanes each direction, you have your uh, two-way left turn lane, multi-use path on the, on the right up there, and a five-foot concrete sidewalk on the far left. And after you do all the math there, you'll still have, and one of the concerns that came up were, you know, people were wondering whether or not they'd even have tree lawns. Uh, between the, if you do the math up there, you'll see that there's about 15 feet of, of grass between the sidewalks and curbs. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna have the same amount on each side of the road. Um, the, the road does have some, you know, uh, curbs in it. So it does hug one side uh, in, in certain areas as well as there's utilities, existing utilities in the way that uh, also are, you know, part of a challenge of designing such a, a complex project and as well as your grades out there, making sure it all drains properly and uh, you, you don't have anything that's too steep. So the plan is to make it better than what it was today. Uh, right now, the, the, the plans are down at ODOT right now. We're still waiting for uh, federal approval. Uh, the plan is to hope to have it bid out in August, but we will have to wait for federal authorization. Uh, construction completion, we're anticipating July of 2024, and that's based on largely, you know, this day and age, unfortunately, inflation and uh, supply issues we have uh, are causing lots of issues with contracts. So, um, and traffic poles are very, have very long lead times as well as water lines and, and whatnot. So we're, we're gonna give the contractor plenty of time to, to, to complete the project. Uh, we do plan on having a meeting with all the, which we, we would hand deliver along the corridor, a uh, you know, notice for residents as well as businesses to uh, attend a, a meeting with the contractor. So if they have questions and concerns and wanna hear from the contractor themselves and see and actually meet them, uh, we do plan on having that uh, once we have a contract signed. Uh, the city as part of this project has received $8.3 million from both NOACA and safety funds from the state of Ohio. Uh, and uh, so we, we anticipate the city's share uh, in this project to be uh, not too much more than that, but with, until we you know, finalize it and have all the inflation dollars added in there. We, we, we don't know exactly what that'll be, but um, we are uh, aware of all that. So the next project I'd like to talk about, which is very similar to East Broad Street, is Cleveland Street. Uh, we call it Cleveland Street, but the project actually goes further than Cleveland Street. Uh, the project limits include Cleveland Street from Hawthorne to East Bridge, which is the section of Cleveland Street that ODOT did not complete uh, a few years ago. It then will continue up East Bridge Street to Broad Street, and then we'll have a small section of Broad Street uh, from East Bridge Street to Cedar Street as part of that project. And that has to do with a lot of the, uh, the traffic lights that are out there that we needed to uh, make sure everything uh, worked properly and flowed properly. Uh, the existing road largely for Cleveland Street is, is, has two lanes in each direction. So it's a four lane road. Um, as well as East Bridge Street has largely has four lanes and uh, East Broad Street, our Broad Street, I believe that's is four lanes. So it's largely two lanes in each direction. Um, the traffic lights are similar to East Broad Street. They're antiquated, they're set on uh, pre-programmed cycles. So they're not efficient and they don't provide the safety for uh, the traveling public as well, or, as, as, or it doesn't, I wouldn't say safety, they just, it is very inefficient. Uh, so, which is never a good thing. Uh, a safety study was also completed in 2019. Uh, it also showed uh, traffic, roughly 10,000 cars per day as well. Uh, this corridor had a approximately 100 crashes identified in the three year period. The crashes that were, that were largest in the 
uh, for this corridor were side swipes as well as rear end crashes. And uh, so knowing that, the, one of the conclusions for to help mitigate those type of crashes is to perform what's called a road diet to shrink the road from four lanes down to three lanes. And that allows vehicles to get over into a center lane and, and turn without obstructing the, 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 the traffic behind it, which is more efficient and uh, it, it's a safer way. Uh, as well as we're going to have, uh, I don't know if most people don't probably don't know this, but Cleveland Street, as well as East Bridge and Broad there, they are on a U.S. federal bike route, which is bike route 30, U.S. bike route 30. So uh, one of the things is, it's included in the safety study was to try to accommodate bike traffic as well. So uh, the plan is to upgrade the traffic signals as well, including the preemption, vehicle detection, and pedestrian uh, signals and push buttons. Uh, the rideability, once again, the, the road is bumpy, we know that. We're trying to maintain it the best we can until we can get this project uh, started uh, and improve the overall safety as well as, once again, not just vehicles, but for pedestrians. Uh, the, uh, the improvements will include uh, a road diet, as we discuss. Uh, as part of that, we will be replacing curbs uh, largely on both sides of Cleveland Street, even some on East Bridge. Not of all, East, not all the curbs in the corridor are being replaced, but uh, I would say probably 90 to 95% are. Uh, the asphalt pavement will be milled and replaced. Uh, new pavement markings and signage will be included with the new high-vis uh, markings to make the, the route safer and more, or it, just bring it to, uh, you know, people's attention as far as how uh, the signs and things should be as far as what lanes to be in. Uh, new traffic signals will be installed. Once again, mast arms uh, with the signals with back plates and 12 inch diameter signal lenses. These are all pretty much standard nowadays uh, by federal highway and requirements. Uh, pedestrian countdown signals to, to help move pedestrians through the intersections uh, as well as vehicle detection and, and preemption. The Cleveland Street will have a bike lane as well as uh, uh, East Bridge Street. Uh, it varies in width. Uh, on Cleveland Street, I believe it's about four foot wide. The bike lane it's a little bit it's a little bit under the national standard, but it still conforms uh, within uh, most bike lanes. So the uh, sidewalk. Most of the sidewalks will be replaced as well as part of this because we are replacing curbs. We are installing under drains as well as on East uh, Broad Street, we're installing under drains as well. And these type of, uh, of improvements just help prolong the, the life cycle of the infrastructure that we are putting out there. So these things uh, will make it last longer and, and, and allow our dollars to go to other places later on. Uh, concrete drive approaches will be replaced as well as ADA ramps and, and uh, curb ramps will all be replaced uh, to today's standards. Uh, the, uh, this project is a little bit behind of Broad Street, so they are staggered a little bit. Uh, Cleveland Street, uh, we anticipate bidding out early 2023 and having a completion date of November of 2024. Uh, we will also have a meeting with residents and businesses to go over uh, any questions they may have when the contractor is on board. These, uh, these dates are, as of right now, because we're still in the middle of the design phase, it's, it's still to be finalized, but uh, we're pretty confident that these are the dates we're gonna hit. Uh, the project, this project uh, has also received uh, funds from NOACA and, and the ODOT safety funds in a total of $5.3 million. Uh, Cleveland Street project will require a little bit more city funds than the East Broad Street. East Broad Street actually received uh, special exemptions on that that uh, allows the cities required, typically when you receive federal funds, 
uh, safety funds as well. There's always a city share you're required to, to come up with. Uh, East Broad Street actually received an exemption for that project to allow us to uh, utilize safety funds as city funds, city shares. So it's, there's uh, less funds that are required on the city side. Cleveland Street, there will be a 20% match when it comes to the construction. So um, I think that's all before we get an east side release sewer. So it's going to be Kathy's. All right. Our next, our next project topic is the east side relief sewer, and we call this the big sewer project or the big dig. Um, this is a relief sewer that starts up at our wastewater treatment plant and eventually it will um, meander through the city all the way down to the Eastern Heights neighborhood. Um, the goal of this relief sewer is to reduce our overflows um, within the city, which is a requirement under the Clean Water Act of 1972. Um, we're estimating that overflows will be decreased by 48 million gallons in a typical year, and a typical year is uh, considered about eight, an 18-month storm, which means it averages every 18 months a certain size storm event occurs. So that's what we're considering um, a typical year storm. Um, this plan is part of, or this uh, project is part of an overall wet weather plan that we have um, proposed and we will be putting it in stone here within this year, 2022, but we have been proceeding with projects for the past umpteen years um, to try to meet the requirements of decreasing overflows into the Black River. This next phase, which is uh, phase 1D and 2N, or 2 North, um, we're going to be installing approximately a little over 1.5 miles of pipe, 66 inch to 78 inch, on Poplar, over to Harwood, to Dilworth, down Gulf. Um, and on East Bridge Street, where we will um, end for this phase. Um, we plan on this project starting on East Bridge, which may sound backwards, which it is, but because of the Cleveland Street work that John just described, we want to go ahead and get that portion of the project done first so that when Cleveland Street project is ready to go, that our contractor isn't in their way, and um, there's no worry about coordination or issues with timing, material acquisition, that type of thing. So let's get that part done first, and then we'll jump back on Poplar Street where we left off with the last phase, which was our phase 1C. It ended right there on Poplar near Longfellow. Um, I'll just run through these really quick. On Poplar, we're looking at you know continuation of the, the big sewer being installed. Well, we're, we're replacing the sanitary sewer uh, because of the location of it, the size of it. Um, so we're upgrading that. Um, once these two sewers are installed, we're pretty much gonna destroy the entire pavement. So if you're familiar with what We've done on Whitman Boulevard and Bon Air. We're going to be doing the, basically the same thing on Poplar. We'll be replacing the pavement and installing new concrete curb and gutter from where we start um, at Longfellow all the way down to um, Harwood where we make the turn. Um, go down Harwood, same thing, we're going to be replacing uh, Restoring the pavement, replacing that section of hardwood with new curb and gutter, and then continue down Dilworth. Now on Dilworth, not only are we replacing the sanitary sewer, but we also have to replace the water main on that street as well, just because of the location. Uh, 
there's only so much room in the right of way, so trying to fit everything in, sometimes we have to move something to get something else, and there's rules that you know, sewers have to be so many feet away from water lines, so um, sometimes it's tight. So in this case, they're getting a new water line and sanitary sewer as well as release sewer, um, and their pavement will also be replaced as well as new concrete curb and gutter. And on Gulf Road, the new sewer will pretty much stay on the east side of the road, so as the sewer heads down towards East Bridge, um, that side of the road will be restored um, depending on how much damage is done. During construction, we'll see how far to the west we have to go. But right now, we're thinking the first, the two lanes heading northbound will be resurfaced as part of this project. We're also going to, while we're in the area, we're going to replace the curbs and just resurface the area right there between Harwood and Gulf along um, Leary Catholic, because that'll be the only little block left of Poplar, and then Poplar will be completely done. Um, everything will be brand new, so that's our plan um, as far as the specifics goes. Now, once we get to East Bridge, now, as I mentioned before, that's work that's going to be taking place first. Um, there's a large diversion structure that needs to be built um, right there between, in the roadway between Smitty's and the BP station. Um, that's because there's a 108 inch uh, storm sewer and it's right at the elevation that our new relief sewer has to pass. And because our relief sewer is, is all working from the treatment plant all the way to east Eastern Heights by gravity, uh, we cannot um, have any issues with elevation. So the diversion structure will help us get through that storm sewer crossing. Um, we'll also restore whatever you need to on East Bridge there between Cleveland Street and the point where we're ending, which is right just um, right before we get to the railroad, railroad tracks. The project will stop there. And then the next phase, which we're a couple years out from that, will take the sewer from where we end with this project underneath the railroad tracks and to the other side on its way down south to um, Eastern Heights. Right now we're looking at uh, bidding and awarding the project in August. Um, that may be a little aggressive, but we're gonna push for it. We have our permit through the EPA already, so now we're just waiting for our funding to get in place through the state uh, loan, state revolving loan program, and then we're off and running, and we're looking at construction being completed in December of 2023. And for this project, just like the other projects, we will be holding a meeting for residents once we get a contractor on board, that way we know what schedules are, um, any details that you know residents may need to know. Um, we want, like to accommodate um, residents as much as possible if there's any um, special issues that you know need to be addressed, deliveries, um, doctor appointments, that type of thing. Uh, the cost of this project is approximately twenty million dollars, and again, we're this is being funded with wastewater funds, but we're paying uh, that through uh, a loan through the Ohio EPA Department of Financial Assistance with a, a low interest loan. The next project is probably one of, the, one of the most popular projects that we do here in the city of Elyria is the City of Street Resurfacing Program. Um, last year, the street resurfacing started in October and we were pushing uh, the work to get done before it snowed. So this year, City Council took steps to get streets selected, approved, funding in place um, sooner than in past years in order to get projects moving uh, sooner. So we have already um, gone out to bid, we already have a contractor on board, and we will be moving forward with uh, 
the project here in the next couple weeks. Um, Council members need to hear from their ward residents. One thing that we do here in engineering is we get a lot of calls from people that, you know, call up and say that, you know, they have really bad street, it needs to be resurfaced. You know, how do they get their streets resurfaced? Why aren't their street on the list to get resurfaced? And, you know, we say, well, we can take the street, we can look at it. I said, but, you know, first and foremost, you know, you should contact your council, your council member that's, Assigned to your ward because you know they they select the streets they they are listening to their constituents and um, if you have two streets as an example if you have two streets that are in the same condition and one street has one or two people on it that say that it needs to be resurfaced and the other street has is silent then you know there's there's probably a good chance that the street that has the couple of people that say, hey, the street needs to be resurfaced, that's probably the one that'll end up on, this, on the list. So um, I highly recommend that if you believe your street needs to be resurfaced to send an email, make a phone call, send a text, whatever the case is, to your council, your ward council member and in order to uh, see what we can do with it. Uh, phase one, which is our asphalt mill and sill project, we're looking at tentatively starting the week of July 5th. Um, we're going to start on the north end of the city, and that's mainly because the contractor that's working currently on Burns Road is the same contractor that's going to be doing this phase one project. So um, as soon as they're done with Burns, they're going to be jumping over into the city resurfacing program. Um, we hope to get everything completed before school starts. Can't guarantee, you never know what weather's gonna do, but as long as the contractor keeps on their toes and the weather cooperates, we should be able to uh, come pretty close to meeting that. Our phase two project is uh, concrete repairs on concrete streets. Now we currently don't have a start date, so we don't know when they're going to start either. We have not had a pre-construction meeting for that project. We do have a contractor on board. So, you know, we are ahead of the game uh, with those streets as well. And that portion of the project is a lot smaller than the first phase. So um, it's a good chance we'll be able to get that project completed in a timely manner as well. The cost, approximately $1.6 million for your 2022 street resurfacing program. And this is all coming from your issue six funds that you as the voters approved. So we're putting all that money into um, streets, make improvements to rideability, um, decrease potholes, that type of thing. We're also doing Ohio Public Works Commission projects. Now these are projects that are also involved resurfacing, um, but we're, they're larger projects and this is something that John looks at every year, what streets are maybe too large for um, a ward council member to include in their portion of the program, but you know, it's still that work that needs to get done. So let's apply for grant funds. These are the streets that receive grant funds. There's usually a portion that needs to be paid by the city, matching funds anywhere from 11 to 25, 30%. But in the end, it's, it's well worth the, the match funding to get an entire street resurface. So Burns Road resurfacing, that's one of them. That's taking place right now. That's why Burns Road is closed. They've already milled the road. They were supposed to work on full depth tonight, but they canceled like 20 minutes ago. Um, uh, but that work should be done, weather permitting, by 4th of July, which is why the contract will be able to jump over to the city resurfacing program after they're done with this one. The Fuller Road resurfacing and culvert replacement, that's from Middle Ave East to the city limits, which is just west of East Avenue. Um, that contract is actually a 
uh, partnership with the Loran County Engineer's Office. They did the plans and as part of the project we're replacing the um, culvert that's just east of Scott Court. Um, and on that culvert we're adding a couple sections of um, culvert, culvert pipe in order to accommodate a walkway path on the north side of Fuller. Uh, and the road will also be resurfaced. Um, and that will take place, it'll get started hopefully this fall. We don't know if the road will be resurfaced this year because it'll really depend on the timing of receiving the box culvert for the culvert replacement. Second and Cedar Street resurfacing, that'll be done sooner than later. It's actually out to bid right now. Um, the water lines works still in progress, it's almost complete. Um, but that um, project will be awarded and hopefully the contract can get on that as soon as possible. And if it's the same contract as doing the city resurfacing, then they'll just add it to their list and just hit it when they go through this area. Overland and Leary Road resurfacing, that project is also um, going to receive the grant funds and it's scheduled to get completed this year. West Ave resurfacing from Barris to 8th Street, that also is scheduled to get uh, resurfaced this year. One thing I do want to mention, and I don't have the link available, but we are just about ready to roll out a new GIS map, um, which there will be a link on the city website that will include all of our projects. Um, our resurfacing projects, sewer projects, waterline projects, oh, any project that we can think of um, will be on this map. And you'll be able to click on the location of where this project's located and you'll be able to get the information, who the contractor is, timing, schedule, what it is, um, that type of thing. So hopefully we have the, I call it the prototype, but or the beta version, but hopefully we can get that up and running by the end of this week. And um, eventually that'll morph into possibly a um, uh, product that people can look at. And then also we'll be able to get comments from um, our residents as far as, you know, what else they'd like to see, you know, based on what they're seeing off of this map. So that's all I have for a project. Back over to the mayor. Yep, good job. Good job, Kathy. Good job, John. Um, again, there's a lot going on in the city right now, and I'm glad you're getting a snapshot of what's going on. Um, but, you know, overall, what, what we're trying to do, I think what we all desire is not to play uh, Super Mario Kart as we're driving down the road, dodging potholes. Uh, we don't want to be replacing rims because we're, you know, blowing out tires. Um, I think there's a desire to have walkability in our city where you can get out with a stroller and walk and enjoy your city. Um, you know, if you like to bike as well, but just having that accessibility and that connectivity around the city, I think that's something we all desire. And, um, and then with those big projects like Broad Street in particular, um, this is our entry point and gateway into the city. And when we first started talking about Broad Street, we weren't able to disclose some of the things that have now come out about this big investment happening downtown and the excitement around that and how we want the community to be connected to downtown. We weren't able to share those things at the time, but now we can, it's, it's public now. And so that's a big driver of why we want to have these amazing sort of arrivals so that, that people get a feel when they're coming into Elyria, that they feel like, wow, this city has got it together. This, I'm arriving into something special. Uh, so that's, that's one bar, part of the Broad Street um, aspect of it. And, um, and, um, and so, yeah, the other thing is that I, I, there's lessons learned from Cleveland Street. And this is from an outsider looking in. I wasn't in this role at the time. But um, as many of you know, uh, we lost a major employer on Cleveland Street. And it seemed like we timed it in a way where uh, right after they left is when we got the road complete. Well, we have another major employer who has expressed concerns about Broad Street and would like to see improvements there. 
And so a part of my move to be a lot more expeditious about Broad Street is I don't want to I don't want to give an opportunity for a similar situation. I want to make sure we're being very responsive to what the business community is saying about, hey, we're bringing visitors into this city from all around the world. We like, one, the traffic signals. They mentioned how they spend a lot of time sitting at those signals to take someone downtown. Um, and then just the status of the road, that they're sitting there, uh, you know, avoid, like I said, playing Mario Kart on the road. But then also it's going to provide with this walkability an opportunity for those employees at Diamond Products, that Ridge Tour, that whole business and industrial hub over there to be able to walk downtown and walk back to the office or walk back to the factory as well. So, again, we're trying to make sure we're taking into account what our business community is saying, what our residents desire, uh, you know, that walkability. That's what these communities are these new developments that are happening, and we're like, man, how, why are people spending these $300,000 on these homes, et cetera? A lot of what we're hearing is the walkability, that people want to be able to get outside, walk with their families. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I, I'm going to try to be honest with you and not get in trouble with saying this. Um, you know, bike lanes on the road are cool, um, but my, I can't push a stroller on that bike lane. I can't put my kid on that, but I can push on a shared use path. I can use those. I can't put my kid on, on the road. So, you know, I'm all for us, you know, promoting biking, but even more so, I'm a proponent of accessibility, active transportation, whether you're walking, biking, scooting, strollering, you know, that's to me is, is a great opportunity we should think about outside of just these projects. So with that being said, I wanna open up the floor for some ideas. I want you to know your ideas matter. Uh, 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 Engineer McKillops mentioned uh, this year we are able to bump up our road resurfacing from October of last year to now we're kicking it off here, June, late June, early July. And that came out of a work session like this around infrastructure. And, and the comment was made, why don't we choose these roads earlier on in the process so that we can take them out to bid early. And I'm proud of city council for, for, for trusting us in that. And they, they bought into it, they did it. We got it out to bid and now here we are three months ahead. Hopefully now with when school starts, we won't be dealing with that competing interest as well as people will have a chance to actually enjoy the road. Cause as you know, in Ohio, you got snow and orange barrels. So uh, it's, uh, it'll hopefully provide a window where you actually get a chance to enjoy the roads that once they're done. But I'll open it up uh, to, to questions, ideas, concerns, and I'll try to repeat what you state and then uh, get you an answer. Yes. Yeah. Major throw. Yeah. I think it's a resource thing as, 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 uh, as, and you can probably speak to this better than I, but um, with the road resurfacing program, that's really targeting residential road, uh, roads, like inside of neighborhood roads. And these long stretches, it'll eat that money up pretty quick. So that's why we try to use the, uh, the public works money to do those longer roads. And that's what you see there. Yeah, that is it. That's it. Yeah. So, so the other comment that was made that I think was important to note, whether we need to change it or not, is up to you all, is the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Is that, you know, if you keep advocating and, and, and pushing for your council folks and then get in here and push for it, it can get done. Um, that's the way it is now, whether that's the way it should be in the future. I know, I know Larry's got an idea about what it should look like in the future, uh, but I know that that's how it is now. The squeaky wheel tends to get the oil. Now we've done alleys with a resurfacing program, uh, so no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Yep. So what ward do you live in? Fifth, Fifth ward. Okay. Yep. So yeah. you got four at large people and a council person. Uh, it's fine. Well, some of them, you know, we'll make sure you got their contact information. Some of them at work and things like that where they might not have been able to make it. But um, 
Um, we'll make sure you get your four at-large members, and, and you got three here that they, they make a difference too. They have to vote on that as well. Yep. Larry, did you want to share your idea about? Yep. Yeah, sure. Every other year, you go back and forth, and half the city would have 1.6 million one year, 1.6 million troops. I think you get a lot more roads done, you can achieve a lot more citizens, and you're looking at overall city improvement. I've got other ideas up here too that are never back and forth, like other ones you still have the traffic lights. Yeah. I'll let Director Mc I have the same question, by the way. So I'll let Director McKillop's answer because I, I have the same question about some of these lights in some of these areas. And so could you share a little bit about the process that it takes? Because it is changeable, you know, but so could you share a little bit about the process? Sure. In some cases, um, and I'm not sure specifically that, you know, specific intersection, but in some cases, in a lot of cases, the intersection hardware is not designed to um, accommodate the, um, the vehicle detection or, or the cabinet, the traffic cabinet, which is the thing on the side of the road with you know, all the hardware in it, isn't expandable. It's either too small or the infrastructure that's, infrastructure that's inside the cabinet is, I don't want to say outdated, but it's to the point where without spending buku bucks to upgrade it. Um, Oh, that's that's possible. Just doing a blinking, just a blinking. The one thing issue that we do have with just signals blinking is the question when someone does pull up to the signal, is it blinking red on all four sides or three sides, or is it just blinking red on my side? Is it yellow on the other side? So, I mean, it's possible. I mean. I mean, our hope, I think our long-term goal is for something to happen at the mall. So, you know, is there, you know, do we take the signal entire intersection mm -hmm. out and then hope someday that, you know, someone has to pay to have it put back? Blinking. That, that, that was a, thank you, Kevin. And that was my, my, my piece was just make it blinking. There's a couple intersections where I just wonder why don't we just have it blinking as opposed to, yep, yep, we got Ed and then we'll go to Jason. Yep, so the question was around, are there grants out there to help with these traffic systems? And yes, we use, we're currently using a grant uh, through NOPEC to, to get a smarter traffic system 
Um, so it's really, again, about how do we prioritize to get to knock them out? How do we get them on a list and knock them out every year? We're tackling 10 intersections or five intersections, but uh, there is grant money out there. And I think there will be even more now with this, uh, this infrastructure bill, uh, but it, it's costly. I think you mentioned that it's costly to put these, these uh, high tech traffic signals in, but I think it's worth the investment because of the carbon footprint, as well as people sitting in traffic when nothing's going on around them, the waste of time, the, 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 the cost of that as well. Okay, Jason. Make that a goal, a, a 2022, 2023 goal. Now here we go. Go ahead, go ahead, John. Let's see. Go ahead, go ahead. I, I, unfortunately, I have to. The, the big issue we would have if we did remove all the lights is we would not have pedestrian crossings. You would have people have to cross a five-lane road and just run and hope, and that's the problem. I would say that West River Road would definitely be a road that could use a road diet, though, and you would actually shrink your road down to three lanes, just like we would do. You could shrink, you could maybe shrink it in a way that you keep the concrete. You could make those bike paths. You know, you could have a bike path on the outside lanes and keep just the two, well, one lane in each direction and a two-way left turn lane in the middle. That would help move traffic, but once again, pedestrian traffic, you have to include that as well. And, and I think there's an opportunity cost with all this stuff that a lot of times it's just we have to make a, a gut check decision and just say, hey, it's not going to be a perfect solution, but it's the best solution. So, for instance, that example of, okay, well, what about the four people that cross that street for the week? You know what I mean? And it's like, okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, no, no. But yeah, I agree with that. When we're talking about, yep. Yeah, we're talking about from McDonald's to uh, Home Depot. That big stretch right there where you keep slowing down, wait for the left signal to finish, and then go, and you stop again, wait for like that sort of, you know. Yeah, so again, I think there's these gut moments where, again, nobody, everybody's not going to be happy. I think that's one thing I'm learning about this, this role is that sometimes you just have to make some of these decisions that, that benefit the majority that a few, you have to figure out how do you accommodate? How do we make sure we're not just excluding folks and forgetting them, but at the same time, we can't hold, hold up progress as a city. And that's a tough seat to be in is, is be the person that says, yes, we need to do this for the sake of progress, though it may hurt in this way. Um, and, um, and I'm very sensitive to that. I take it very, very serious when I hear your concerns. Um, and, 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 and I want to make sure I'm sensitive to it and responding to it. But I hope you also understand the sentiment that I share around the opportunities that we have in front of us. And like, let's take advantage of these opportunities to be more efficient, to, to, to take our city into the 21st century um, and, and, and balance those things with that. But, you know, keep pushing us on both sides. Go ahead, Larry. Yep. Do you want to speak to that? Yes. So, yeah, so, 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 on the charging station. Um, no, no, that's good. So, on the charging station, I don't know if either one of you want to speak to the charging station piece. We did get a grant for a couple charging stations. 
we, the, the city actually received a grant to install a, a two-port charging station in our parking lot. Uh, well, it's a grant. <laughs> It's a level two. It's a level two uh, charging station. It'll be in our back parking lot. The equipment's actually on order right now. Um, it's probably going to be at least another two to three months before we get the equipment in and it it installed. But hopefully by the fall we'll have two level two charging stations. And, in the, and the county lot. is also installing two yeah. as well. So we'll be doing two. The county's doing one at one of their facilities and then the community college will have one as well. So. Well, it's interesting. A part, of, a part of the discussion we've been having at NOACA is what role should the public play, the government play in charging stations? Because what the belief is is that uh, eventually you'll see these at gas stations. When you pull up to get-go, you won't, you'll be pulling over to the, tr and how much are we going to be competing with the private industry by installing these? So there's, there's that dialogue that's happening now around how much should you charge residents to, to charge up on your station? So there's a, this is a, this is an interesting time for these discussions. And I think right now as a region, we're trying to determine what role does government play? And it sounds like we are playing more of an introductory role to like expose people to charging, but it sounds like the private sector is going to be the group that actually takes it and runs with it. Yep, yep. You got the right voltage. Yeah. Yeah, if you got the right voltage, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned that. So I met with Chief Pelco this morning and, uh, you know, one of his major priorities right now is traffic enforcement and figuring out how to, um, you know, uh, rein in some of the, the, the bad driving habits here in the city of Alia Red, speeding, texting and driving, et cetera. So that's a huge priority. So I think that's going to help address some of it. When, when people start getting the feeling, hey, you got to watch how you drive in Elyria because you'll get a ticket. When that, when that feeling starts to get out there, uh, that'll be real. Uh, the other piece is that um, you know, a lot of these, these paths, and this is my opinion on these shared use paths, again, is that um, most people using these paths will be walking or on strollers. It won't be a lot of folks. There's, you know, it's similar to this, and that's why I'm very skeptical about like taking up road space for just thinking bikes because I think most people are just, they just want to get out and walk. Like I, I'm not trying to, and I'm not going to walk in the road, you know, and I don't want to be walking on this sidewalk that I keep tripping over. And if I got a, if I got a, a assisted walking, I can't walk down the, so I think most of the use is going to be just pedestrian use. Um, so I, I say that because then there's less of a surprise when it comes to traffic because you're walking. Yeah, yeah. So there's a there's a healthy gap between the road and this path. I, I definitely enough that your trash can and stuff will be in that gap. No, it will not be on the road. Yeah, they, they share, on Cleveland Street, that's what they're proposing. Now, if we could come up with something creative around that, I, you know, Ed, I might need your help on that. But, you know, because, again, to me, that Middle Avenue bike path, you know, I don't, I don't see that being used as often as, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting strip of land uh, on the road there. I mean, when, my, when I ride with my group, we use it, but that's like once in a week, you know, and so then it sits there otherwise. Yes, ma'am. All of it. I'm moving in. No, no, I'm joking. No, no. No, he, he'll give you a real answer. No, because we talked about that. We know that's a major concern. You know that's a major concern. Depending where you live, I'd have to go look at the plans, but you, no, no, but I'm saying as far as where on the street you, you live, 
I could say the, 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 the issue, yeah, when all said and done, there's going to be approximately 15 feet of green space between both sides of the road, whether it's seven and a half feet or it's seven and nine or seven and, nine, seven and eight or seven and a half. And a half it, there will be about 15 feet. So uh, there will be green space. It won't be as big as it is now because we do need to uh, we do need uh, room to put in the, the additional lane in the middle. And uh, so I believe the existing road right now is 22 feet wide. So we're taking six feet from both sides, roughly. Now, a lot of that area in those areas it, it, from Prospect Street to Abbey Road have ditches about three feet in. So you can't even really use a lot of your tree lawn as it is because there's, it's, it's holding water, there's ditches, things of that nature. We're gonna have curbs over there. We're gonna drop the road down in some areas, 18 inches, so we can get positive drainage as much as possible going to the road. There will be under drains on both sides of the road to catch anything that, that goes over into the tree lawn. So. Behind it, there'll be a little yard in, inlets in, in, in some of the uh, streets. It all depends, once again, uh, sorry, some of the properties, because it all depends on where you are in the whole corridor, because some areas were able to drain all the way to the road, some areas have a, a small, or they're, they're pretty much flat. So we're gonna have something in there to drain it. You have a board here too, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's got a board that he can show you, you know, once we debrief here, and you can actually look on the board, and he can show you where the curves and stuff are drafted, where they are drafted. Uh, Ms. Battle, and then we'll come back up here up front. Oh, yep, yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, let's uh, just make note of that. Kevin's back there. Kevin just started two days ago, part of community engagement. So if you could make note of that, we'll see what we can do on, on making sure that gets addressed. And again, we want some ideas as well. Again, I think that what ideas do you have around projects? I know, Ms. Riggins, you had some ideas about your HOA. You had some questions. Do you want to share some of the ideas or questions you had as well? Are we able to deploy somebody out to go inspect that? Is that something that we... You don't come up here, come on up here. <laughs> we did have a, a gentleman go out and he looked at the 57 portion and he, there is an issue over there as far as erosion on 57. Uh, as far as within Stony Brook itself, it's 100% private property. We don't, and it's a natural drainage course the way the water goes through there. So it, it's really, I mean, we, we're more than welcome to come out there and, and, and give you ideas, but it ultimately will fall on to the homeowners association as far as the improvements. But yeah, we, we, yeah, I mean, you can go out there, you can put some fabric down, you can put, and on top of the fabric, you put uh, rocks, large rocks, and it can help. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it, it, sometimes you gotta pin it or you gotta use, a, 
like I said, you use a fabric. I don't know if they use a fabric in there or they use a geotextile or what they might have used or if they just threw rock down there. Uh, there's diff many different ways to help it. And uh, sometimes maybe putting a rock. Yeah, put maybe maybe putting a ditch check in there as well to help slow the water down because if it's an erosion issue, you want to slow it down and let it bleed slowly. So there's some ideas we can do. It's just a matter of, you know, what you have there. Yeah. So for sure, I think, you know, John is showing he's willing to be a resource for the, your association. If you call on him, he can be a resource. But what other ideas do you all have? You know, some of the ideas I've heard I've been around, these are outside of this meeting, have been around how do we connect Cascade to downtown? How about we, you know, uh, a bridge that connects this side of the falls to the other side of the falls? I've heard the, the need for another connector road that connects Lake Ave with um, 57, I think. Yeah, the, like the Shadden Road connection. And so what other ideas do y'all have around projects that need to happen within the city? Jason, and we're going. So I'm glad you said that because one thing I need from you all as residents is to stay on this process. As these public meetings happen and whatnot, to make sure you're showing up providing this feedback. Like we'll take this and we'll, you know, we'll 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 state, hey, yeah, you know, but the hear it coming from you all is gonna carry a different weight than coming from us. So if that's truly a desire that hey, we wanna see, you know, the aesthetics look, you know, uh, consistent and you know we need y'all to be at that meeting telling those contractors that as well. Um, and again, we'll do what we can to echo and advocate as well. She should go here, then, then Tiffany, and then we'll go here. Oh, I'm sorry, did you hear? Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so the walk path is on the right side. That's a shared use path. So you can walk, stroller, you know, crawl. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no. I think the 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 purpose of course of going back is to improve walkability within the city, to make it a more walkable, more active transportation route into the city. If we built it on the road, then you're limiting who can use the the path. You know, you're limiting it to scooters and bikes, et cetera, versus just your everyday walker and stroller that they're not, you know, bumping. And that's the reason why we would uh, install it on asphalt. So you're not bumping over everything as you're going down. You got a nice smooth path going back and forth. Um, I can't necessarily speak to the Middle Avenue and what the thinking was around that, because um, I just wasn't here, but. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, to an extent. I mean, there, there's some truth to that, um, but it, this is an intentional decision. You know what I mean? It's not like, hey, there's money, because I feel like some projects in the city, it's like, oh, here's some money, let's do it, versus this is intentional. Like, we are intentionally want people to have an amazing experience going down Broad Street from a driving and a walking standpoint. Do they, they get downtown, they're going down Broad Street, and they're like, wow, this is a city, you know, 
um, and give them that real feel. So this is very intentional. Um, so, well, let's go to Councilman. Councilman. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for the presentation. I see the vision. I like the broad description of, of East Broad Street as the gateway to the city, and I like how it complements the exciting improvements coming into the downtown. I think when we're talking about the, the shared use path and how it's safer than because people can push strollers on the shared use path, I think of an incident I saw on Garford Avenue oh, a couple months back. I saw a woman pushing a stroller in the street, and I, I slowed down and I rolled down my window. I said, ma'am, uh, are you pushing your stroller in the street because the sidewalks are, are so dangerous? And she nodded her head yes. So I think that if I had to pick between a bike path or, or rather, sorry, a shared use path, which is prone to asphalt, okay, it can get distresses, shoving, alligator cracking. The engineers know all the different types of, of distresses that go on asphalt as opposed to concrete. And I know Kenny probably, Councilman Oswald probably knows many of them as well. Uh, but if I had to pick between the displacement that can take place in sidewalks and a shared use path to push a stroller as a father, I'd probably pick a shared use path because I can trip on the displaced pavement, the stroller. I have to push the stroller over the displaced pavement, you know? So, I mean, I know that it comes to subjectivity at that point, but I, I like the idea of the shared use path for strollers. But when it comes to asphalt or concrete, I did, I did see Deb Selman in the audience, and I know that that's something that she had some questions about. Deb, did you, do you feel more comfortable with, with asphalt after this presentation? And, and, and push back. I mean, uh, you know, we had the conversation around asphalt versus concrete, and I said we should let the residents push us which direction they want that to go. Um, because I do think, you know, uh, the aesthetics of concrete, I don't want to persuade y'all how I feel about it. What, what do y'all think? Go ahead. Yeah. Correct. On the north side, you'll have a five foot sidewalk. I don't know what it is. I mean, I think a lot of areas over there right now are range from three to four, but you'll have five foot, which is the standard concrete. and be concrete. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I know this is a topic for Leanne. She's been pushing for sidewalks for a long time. Yeah, um, you know, sidewalks, what's that? Yeah, there, there's, um, you know, sidewalks are technically the, the, the homeowner's responsibility, but when they live on these roads to get these projects, they get an opportunity to get a new sidewalk. And so part of what we've been proposing through Councilman Oswald, actually, a part of uh, his pitch to do this home beautification program is that we will provide grants to homeowners to be able to redo the sidewalks in front of them. Um, no doubt. Not everybody's going to have a car that's going to be buying a home. No doubt, no doubt. And that is a mainstream. All these. Yep. What else is around here? Other than this. I mean, we have a lot of stores around here. Yeah, yeah. That walkability. Middle Avenue is really thin. Mm hmm. I have seen so many people. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Electric scooters, mm -hmm. mothers pushing shoulders. Yeah. That I've actually almost gotten put into the ditches because mm -hmm. people not want to make way. Yeah. We need sidewalks, or somebody's going to be too big to build. Yeah. Yeah. I've been fighting five years for a new sidewalk. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Done now. Yeah, for sure. Done now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
it's a historically low income neighborhood and there's grants that can be specifically used for that community. Um, but I think it's just, again, it's having the advocacy that push for it to happen. It's not that it's out of our, our, our ability. It's just having the stomach to be able to answer, well, why'd you do it here and not there? Um, which is, Yeah, yeah. 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 So so the question was how could it make it safe? I mean, from a if everything was pure, the the owner of that land would put sidewalks in. You know, the owner of that land would say, I want to be responsible to the residents who live in this park. I'm gonna put sidewalks in to make them out. Now can they afford it? Why haven't they done it? That's a question between you and who owns that property or between me and who owns that property. Um yeah, yeah. And I don't mind having that conversation, but you know, um, yeah, so I mean, but that too is ultimately responsible now. And I think that's part of the rub that we feel is, man, these folks should be taking responsibility for their residents and doing this. When we step in, what message are we sending? But then I think, again, you think about the residents who suffer because of a bad business person, not saying they are, but just in general, but should the residents suffer because of a bad, uh, you know, business practice. And I think, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, I, I get. I hear you. I hear you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, pardon me. Please, please. I just really wanted to piggyback up something Leanne just said. There's, there might be a good answer, uh, Ms. Arroyo, in the HSIP systemic safety funding. It's a new grant that just got rolled out by ODOT. I think the application procedure for it is in January, and I think some of that money goes towards sidewalk repair and things like that. And uh, it, when it comes to Safe Routes to School, a grant that we applied for, I'm really thankful because I just found out today that Representative Gail Manning wrote a letter of support to the Safe Routes to School grant committee um, talking about the importance of, of, of that grant, what it would mean for, for the Eastern Heights area in specific. So, yeah. uh, so there's a lot of different grants through ODOT that might be able to solve those problems. No doubt, no doubt about it, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yep. 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 For sure. Yeah, thank you for that. First off, I want to thank y'all for being here. I mean, that's, that, that to me speaks volumes, the fact that y'all chose to come out here in the evening and use your time for here, and I hope it's been worth it. The second thing is that guy right there who just started two days ago, don't <laughs> Kevin Cloud, that is his responsibility now to make sure we're trying every mode of communication that we can to get messages out about meetings, agendas, et cetera. And so we're going to support him. We're not going to put all the load on him because we're working with departments. I think engineering has really stepped it up in communicating road closures and things like that. So everybody's trying to do their part, but it, there's a huge gap in terms of who gets the information, who shows up, who, who doesn't get the information. And uh, it's, a, it's a huge priority for us. Not for sure. Yep. Of every administration. Appreciate that. It's the one thing that the website is so much better than it used to be. Uh, and water bills and things mm. like that are so much better than so, that's cla let's clap it up for Jason, give him a compliment. A compliment. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I'm joking. I'm joking with you. No, I appreciate that. No doubt. It is a priority and uh, I think the more informed you all are, the better city we'll have. So that's a priority. Ms. Riggins and then Larry. Utility bill. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Especially nowadays, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. And and, and bring that kiosk thing. That kiosk, yeah, yep. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep. 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 And again, that's why I'm thankful for y'all coming out here. I mean, it's I, this means a lot to me, y'all being here. I, I, I just honestly say this. This has been a a, a, a couple weeks here, quite a couple weeks here, um, and so y'all being here, it, it 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 means a lot. So thank y'all, and it means a lot to us who put in the work for these things. So thank y'all, Larry. I got a question. I'll close this uh, out. Yeah, yeah. 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 No doubt. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, so you know, that's always you know my 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 top priority. That's what keeps me up at night is. Midway Mall, and I agree, it's the first thing that people see. When I talk to people all around the country, and I'm like, I'm from Elyria, they're like, oh, that's the place on the, on the turnpike that I get off of. This. So I, I know that's the only impression they get, is when they get off that turnpike, get their gas or whatever, and get back on. That, that's our moment to, to impress them and say, oh, let me check out more or not. You know, we're, we've had really good conversation. Councilman Oswald joined me in a meeting we had with the uh, commissioners recently about the mall. Uh, I'm still confident in, in a lot of the plans that we've had. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, I'm learning patience, um, because I feel like, you know, I, I feel like, you know, to be honest, I feel like if we would have made some more decisive decisions earlier on, we wouldn't be in this boat we're in now, but we are, so it's all good. And, uh, but I feel like we're at a good place. I don't know, Councilman Oswald, if you would echo that, but I feel like we were in a good place after that meeting. Go ahead, please turn your mic on. Okay, so I might be one that has more information on East Broad Street than most of the people here because I grew up on East Broad. I was born 62 years ago, and my parents bought the house 66 years ago. My dad told me the realtor told them when they bought the house, and you probably heard the story, that they were going to widen East Broad Street. I got pictures of cars parked on Broad Street. This has been 66 years too long. Wow. Like you said, the gateway to the city, it should have been done a long time ago, but it's such an undertaking. It would get started and then it would stop. My dad would roll over in his grave because he was against the widening of Broad Street. And 20, 25 years ago, because they're gonna take my trees and it's gonna be too close for the kids going to school. The shared use is a great idea. I'm glad they're doing it. And I still own the properties over there on East Mm. Broad. The problem is, and nobody's giving me an answer, is who's going to maintain it? It's nothing, no big deal in the summer, but in the winter. Now, if you want people biking and going down, walking, who's going to maintain that? So nobody's really, well, they'll do half of it, and they'll do half of it. And I'm like, somebody's got to figure that part out. Yes, so that that is the answer. The answer is the residents will not be responsible for uh, shoveling any more than they would if it was a regular size sidewalk. So four feet, clear the four feet like you would any other sidewalk. And that's what people, we're not expecting people to be biking in the snow. But, um, you know, clear that four feet out and that's what you're responsible for. And then we just purchased some machines through Parks and Rec. Well, we'll be able to plow through those as well. So, you know, we, but we don't want to just blanket say that and then people not be like oh i'm not doing it. i'll just wait for the plow to come do their part no it's like every other resident in the city and i hate doing it in the morning you got to get out there shovel that that space so that people can walk down and walk past including the mail people uh who are delivering our mail so they'll still be responsible for maintaining that four feet so the other issue that i know i've had conversations with the engineering department um but right where kipling street dives into the first house on East Broad Street, 
I own that. Now, when we were growing up, what would we do as kids when it start raining? We'd have to go downstairs and put our washer and dryer up on blocks because it floods. Mm, mm. And is that going to get increased in the storm? We got, we're in a fishbowl right there. Mm. Now, I know you're going to change grades on a few. Have they metered and seen what size the storm drains are, if they can maintain? Because there's a lot of water runoff that comes down Kipling Street. The, the storm sewers that are being put in are being put in largely for the road and the tree lawn area. It's not to service the entire area. The area you're talking about, there's a lot of I and I. There's a lot of, you know, when it comes into a floor drain, it's not coming to a storm sewer. It's coming to a sanitary sewer. So there's, there's a lots of, in the Eastern Heights is, which will come in 10, 15 years, I believe, is what the, the program is right now for the, for the long-term control plan. Uh, that's where a lot of that will get addressed as well. Well, okay, so 66 years of that. And so that you've got all that water rushing down there, and it comes in, and it's not like the 400-year water flood deal, but this is on an average heavy rain in, you know, a real quick one. So three houses right there, we are the first ones. We get it up to this level until it slowly disappears. My sister bought a ranch without a basement because she was tired of doing that when we were growing up. So is there money in the infrastructure? Because also the infrastructure is so bad on East Broad Street that water mains have been broken, replaced. There's dips, you can see it. Now I'm not talking where they put the new laterals in or the new um, water lines, the lead lines that they're replacing. But is that all gonna be checked to make sure we don't have to go well, through? Well, I will say that the, there's a portion of the water main that is being replaced. Uh, I don't know of a lot of breaks on Broad Street other than the, what we've done out there. A lot of the issues we've had on Broad Street in the years past, East Broad, I should say, have been sewer-related, sewer leaks that have led to sinkholes and things of that nature, but it, not a lot of water main breaks that I'm aware of. Uh, that's a, a 12 or a 16-inch line that runs down there, so it's a pretty good-sized line. If it broke, it would take out a lot. Uh, it, it is in regards to storm, I think, I think we've had plenty of discussions on storm, but you know, there's no funding for it. Uh, we have our stormwater fee, which is very minimal to, to get things done. Uh, and in the way the ordinances are written, it's, it's on the property owners. So it's not that we can't do improvements and we're trying to do improvements in these areas. It's just, we do have limited funds and you're on council. You tell me, you give me the money, I'll spend it. <laughs> so. And I so, so I know we've reached 7.30. We're, I'm going to stick around. We'll be sticking around. You can keep asking us questions. But I do want to be respectful to folks that came out here and uh, bring a close. So we have your email addresses. Hopefully you signed in. We'll try to make sure that you're getting communicated with as much as possible. If you have other ideas, other questions, concerns, email us, call us, do what you got to do to get your message to us. Um, but please show up to those contractor meetings when those meetings come and make sure your voice is heard there as well. So. Thank you all again for coming out, and uh, have a good night. Thank you.